<clears throat> so we are studying <clears throat> the stages of spiritual growth, which are found in 1 John <clears throat> chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, <clears throat> which I'll read to you again. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I run into you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I run into you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write into you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, <clears throat> because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. <clears throat> so these are the stages of spiritual growth described here in a sequence as being children, then being young men or teenagers, <clears throat> and being fathers. Spiritual growth, <clears throat> it's also referred to or, or called um, progressive sanctification, which basically is defined as an increasing separation from sin in your life and becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We've pointed out that spiritual growth has nothing to do with your standing before God. That was fixed the moment that you got saved. You are God's child. You are going to be God's child forever. Nothing's ever going to change that. It has nothing to do with God's love for you. He loves you fully right now and forever. He's not going to love you more when you get to heaven. He's not. He didn't love you less when you first got saved and didn't know anything. He loves you fully now and forever. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with how long you've been a Christian. <clears throat> Spiritual maturity is <clears throat> relative to where you started at. <clears throat> if you grew up in a Christian home and got saved at a young age, you probably were able to make uh, <clears throat> steps towards spiritual maturity fairly quickly. <clears throat> but if you grew up, in, uh, if you were saved out of an unchristian background <clears throat> or already had a pretty sinful life <clears throat> steeped in the world, you had a lot further to go. So it's relative to where you start at, so it's not really a matter of how long you've been a Christian. It also has nothing to do with how much Bible you know, because you can know a lot and still not apply it in your life. It has nothing to do with how busy you are in the ministry. Busyness doesn't equal spiritual maturity. It has nothing to do with the size of your ministry or the level of influence that you have to others around you, because these things do not necessarily measure one's spiritual maturity. We pointed out that these levels of spiritual growth, <clears throat> they are not a further test of whether or not you're saved, because <clears throat> we've spent weeks and weeks talking about those tests, but this is not one of them. <clears throat> uh, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is affirming to his readers <clears throat> that uh, that these levels of spiritual growth are not for causing them to doubt their salvation. And that's why he starts in verse 12 by saying, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. He's saying, I'm writing to you because you are forgiven. <clears throat> I want you to understand that just because you're not a spiritual father or maybe not even a spiritual teenager in the process of spiritual growth, that doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. <clears throat> and he uses... Uh, for, for the phrase little children, it comes from a single Greek word that we've mentioned. It's technia, which simply means born ones, uh, without any regard for the age. It refers to everyone who has been born, and of course, in this context, everybody who has been born again, without any regard for how long they've been born again. John is saying there's room in the kingdom of God for spiritual babies, for spiritual children, for spiritual uh, teenagers, wherever you are in your spiritual maturity, there's, of course, still room in the kingdom for that. <clears throat> and John added <clears throat> that it's for his namesake. <clears throat> in other words, it's not because you're worthy of it. It's not because you deserve it. It's not because of some merit that you have, but it's for his namesake, which simply means for God's own glory. God forgave your sins. <clears throat> for his own glory. In Isaiah 48, verse 9, God speaks, he says, For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I, frank, will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. God says, For my own sake I forgive you. It brings glory to God to forgive sinners. 
<coughs> so John is saying, I'm writing to all of you Christians because you've all been forgiven, not because you deserve it, not because of merit, but because it pleases God to display his wonder and his grace in forgiving you. So John is saying, you're all in the family if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. <clears throat> but you have to realize that there are degrees of maturity. So if you feel like you're just a spiritual baby, <clears throat> don't think that that means that you're not a Christian. <clears throat> just because you aren't uh, where you want to be in the spiritual process, you can't deny the reality of what the Lord has done in your life <clears throat> when he saved you. So John is not talking about perfection here. He's talking about direction. He's talking about making progress in your spiritual life. <clears throat> so again, verses 13 and 14, he says, I write unto you fathers because you've known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because ye have known the father. I've written to you, written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I've written unto you young men because ye are strong. <clears throat> The word of God abideth in you, and you've overcome the wicked one. So typical of John, there's a lot of repetition there. And John is simply wanting to make that emphasis <clears throat> crystal clear. He's simply saying, I want you to understand this, so I'm going to repeat it. And he does that a lot in his epistles. <clears throat> We're writing that you might know you're saved. We're writing <clears throat> that you might affirm that you're a child of God. <clears throat> with your sins forgiven. But we also want you to recognize that there are levels of spiritual growth. So even if you're not a spiritual father or even a spiritual teenager, you're still a child who's been forgiven. You've still received that great outpouring of God's grace for salvation. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> so we're looking at these categories, beginning with spiritual children. And I read it last week, but I'll read it again. Job 32 verse 9 says, Great men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. Just because somebody's been a Christian for a long time, that doesn't guarantee that they're not a spiritual baby. All spiritual children are supposed to grow up to, as the Bible puts it, the stature of the fullness of Christ, and they should grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's from 2 Peter 3. But it is a sad but unfortunate <clears throat> and unfortunate truth that not everybody does. <clears throat> There are Christians who have stayed immature for years and years and years and years <clears throat> because they won't do, they don't do what is necessary to grow <clears throat> in knowledge <clears throat> and uh, in an understanding. And simply that means regular, consistent study of the Word of God, being in church, being under the sound of the gospel, being preached, being taught. <clears throat> And it's not a part of their life, and it's reflected <clears throat> in their level of maturity. <clears throat> At the end of verse 13, John says, I write unto you little children because ye have known the Father. And again, <clears throat> that's not the same as what he said in verse 12. <clears throat> in verse 12, he referred to little children, meaning everybody. <clears throat> um, verse 13 is different. <clears throat> in verse 13, he replaces that word technia, for little children with the word paideia. And paideia means a little child, a little boy. It can even be used of uh, infants, a little girl. <clears throat> so it refers to somebody who is still under parental instruction <clears throat> because the primary characteristic of the paideia in, in this context is ignorance. It's referring to a lack of maturity. Paideia simply refers to a child who needs to be trained, who needs to be taught, who needs to be instructed. That's why teachers of children were called padigogas, <clears throat> referring to those who teach children. <clears throat> so what does a spiritual child really know? <clears throat> spiritual child knows God, the basic knowledge about their new relationship with Christ. <clears throat> Unfortunately, sometimes not their new relationship. Maybe it's been going on for a long time. But the distinguishing act of a babe in Christ is to acknowledge God is their father and Christ is their Lord. And they express their delight in this relationship. It is the joy of their life just to be saved, just to know they're saved. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, in Romans 8.15, Galatians 4.6, we see uh, the term being used, Abba Father, which means Daddy. And even in natural life, the first thing that happens in a baby's life is, uh, um, relationally, is that parental recognition. The first words they say are Mama, Dada. Uh, <clears throat> that's what they first learn. So little children tend to be regulated by their affections much more than knowledge. <clears throat> They're more affected by their emotions, by their feelings, uh, than they ever are by information. <clears throat> the little children, pretty much, they don't analyze you. They just love you if you're their parent. <clears throat> they find their security in you. Uh, <clears throat> and that's how it is with spiritual babies. There's a certain thrill in their new life. <clears throat> it's the joy of their salvation. They have a great joy from knowing God is their father from knowing that Christ is their Savior, from knowing that God loves them, that He's their protector, He cares for them, He meets their needs, He's given them an eternal home in heaven, He's provided everything they need, and there's great joy from that, but not a whole lot more, not a whole lot of knowledge. They take great joy in that simple, simple knowledge, and that's, of course, a good thing. Would to God that we never lost that, that we don't lose that. <clears throat> but that's where it all starts. <clears throat> it's not really about having a whole lot of information. It's not about theology, really. It's about the relationship. <clears throat> Spiritual babies, they're all about the relationship, much more than they are about doctrine. <clears throat> That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul told the Corinthians, look, here's how I know that you're a bunch of spiritual babies, because you're saying, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. See, spiritual babies tend to attach to their heroes. <clears throat> That's typical of babies. But Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 gives us a serious warning of two spiritual babies. It says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So they can be easily deceived. <clears throat> they need to be cautious regarding that problem. <clears throat> That's the thing about children. They're affectionate. They're drawn to relationships, but they really have no discernment. <clears throat> That's why you taught your kids, don't talk to strangers. <clears throat> They're easily deceived. They don't have any discernment. <clears throat> they tend to believe anything. <clears throat> Jamie has said to me before, she said, God surely watched over me when I was a kid because I would have been the first kid climbing into the back of the van to go help this man look for his lost puppy. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> So discernment, you don't find it in children. Children are vulnerable. And we applaud the fact that they look at the world through rose-colored glasses. That's part of being a child. And they have this certain happiness, this joy that goes along with ignorance <clears throat> and with the lack of experience. And the world will teach them out of that soon enough. But we also fear <clears throat> for them because of that vulnerable vulnerability. They lack wisdom. <clears throat> They lack discernment. They live in danger of being led seriously astray. As I said last week, cults prey on spiritual babies. False prophets make their living off of spiritual babies. <clears throat> so when you see a massive crowd drawn by false teachers, you can be certain that that crowd is a combination of both the spiritually immature and the unconverted. <clears throat> so the second category... John talks about his young men, teenagers. <clears throat> he says in the middle of verse 13, he says, I write unto you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. And then in verse 14, he says, I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. So infants rejoice in the relationship they have with the Father, but this second level of spiritual growth, it's really important <clears throat> because it goes from being focused on the relationship to being focused on knowledge, of learning the theology of what God has done both for you, what he is doing, who he is, what's going on in this world. <clears throat> so it goes from the attachment, which is this emotional tie, the attachment that is a matter of affection <clears throat> to doctrinal issues. Uh, and it's really a beautiful analogy. It says, I write unto you young men, you spiritual teenagers, because ye have overcome the wicked one. 
<clears throat> and that's a really important statement. You've overcome the wicked one. How did you do that? Well, verse 14 says, because ye are strong. Well, how did you get strong? Because the word of God abideth in you. That's how you overcome the wicked one. You get strong <clears throat> by the word of God abiding in you, and it abides in you by studying it and studying it and studying it and filling your heart and filling your mind with the word of God on a continuing basis. <clears throat> what is the characteristic of a spiritual young man, of a spiritual teenager? <clears throat> it's somebody who knows the word of God. <clears throat> the word of God abides in them. They know what the Bible teaches. <clears throat> They're equipped with spiritual knowledge. The chief characteristic of spiritual children is ignorance but the chief characteristic of spiritual teenagers is knowledge. <clears throat> they know doctrine. The word of God abides in them. <clears throat> and as Proverbs 20:29 20, puts it, the glory, of <clears throat> the glory of young men is their strength. So a baby is, is self-absorbed with, with new feelings and their needs and their problems and everything is about them. Everything is personal. But a young man, a young woman, <clears throat> spiritually has outgrown that and looks to find the greater truth, the greater understanding. And I want you to look at one of David's Psalms. It's Psalm 131. It's short, it's only three verses, but it's, it really sheds some light on, on this movement to being spiritual teenagers. David describes himself after having grown from being a child to a young man. Psalm 131, it says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. Here's David in great humility, recognizing that it's not all about him anymore that his understanding has grown. It's not all about me. His focus is no longer on himself or on his own desires. Now he's learned to want what the Lord wants. <clears throat> he says, let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. So his focus has changed. His focus has turned from desiring uh, <clears throat> um, what he wants, what he needs, who he is, <clears throat> to desiring that God be honored <clears throat> and trusted and obeyed. Now, that's a significant move from being a spiritual child who is all about the salvation they received to being a spiritual young man all about knowing and pursuing what God desires. That's the move to being a spiritual teenager. <clears throat> in my own Christian life, I was, I was very, very blessed. And that after about a year and a half of spiritual infancy, um, <clears throat> I got a job working in a machine shop in Chicago where I did little more than operate a drill press, drilling holes in aluminum parts for eight hours a day. Mind-numbing work. But the blessing was is that it was so loud in that place because it was a uh, <clears throat> small warehouse filled with all kinds of drill presses and lays. and It was really, really loud. And so we had to wear protective headphones <clears throat> all the whole time that you were there. <clears throat> just headphones that didn't have any radio or anything like that, and they were just protective headphones. <clears throat> but I was allowed to put a little ear piece in my ear. <clears throat> this was before the days of uh, earbuds and all that stuff. <clears throat> I had a portable radio in my front pocket with an earplug in my ear and my headphones uh, over it. <clears throat> and I... I was able to listen to teaching and preaching of the Word of God all day long, eight hours a day, five days a week, for months and months and months and months. <clears throat> and that was all before I went to Bible college. <clears throat> so I already had a great head start on a biblical education before getting formally trained in Bible college. Remember, I said I was... I didn't get saved till I was 19. <clears throat> I didn't get to grow up in a spiritual household. <clears throat> now, when I got saved, <clears throat> my mom and stepdad had gotten saved uh, several years before me, so it was a good, nurturing, spiritual home when I got saved, but I didn't grow up with all that. <clears throat> so 
<clears throat> I was then a young man, both physically and spiritually, because I got that opportunity to fill my mind <clears throat> with teaching and preaching of the Word of God for hours and hours and hours a day, day after day after day after day. I mean, I got the equivalent of probably 20 years worth of sermons up from just uh, uh, if you all you got was what you got when you went to church <clears throat> in the space of a year. <clears throat> so that was a great blessing to me. <clears throat> Young men, spiritually speaking, are Christians who have acquired knowledge of the truth. <clears throat> they have become well established in this matter of doctrine. <clears throat> As the spiritual food goes in, spiritual strength is the result. And the spiritual food, again, is the Word of God. As, as you hear it, as you read it, as you study it, as it's taught to you, as you meditate on it, as you think about it, that results in spiritual strength. And ye have overcome the wicked one. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting that that verse in the Greek, it's in the perfect tense, <clears throat> which refers to an event that has already happened in the past, but has continuing results. John is saying, you have already conquered Satan. And that's an amazing statement. Already conquered Satan. What's that mean? How could that be? <clears throat> well, you just have to understand where Satan really spends his time, where he operates <clears throat> in this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15, it says that Satan is disguised as an angel of what? An angel of light. An angel of light. See, Satan himself, he's not the one running around making people sin. <clears throat> people sin because of the flesh. <clears throat> Satan spends his time involved in the false religious systems of this world. 99.9% .9 of Satan's activity has to do with false doctrine, false religions, false beliefs. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He works in the false systems, <clears throat> the false ideologies of this world. <clears throat> so don't blame Satan for your sin. I know Flip Wilson said, the devil made me do it. He didn't need to make you do anything. <clears throat> your flesh took care of that just fine without him. <clears throat> you don't sin because Satan goes after you personally. <clears throat> now, there are, of course, his minions, his demons in this world, and they do follow you around. <clears throat> and you have... a uh, probably at least one of them assigned to you as a believer uh, to mess with your life. <clears throat> but Satan's not walking around behind you. <clears throat> People sin because lust conceives in their heart. You know the verses in James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. <clears throat> so we sin because of the lust of our flesh, because we walk in the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 21 tells us the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And those are all works of the flesh. It doesn't say these are the things that the devil is trying to get you to do. These are the works of our own flesh. Psalm 106, verses 36 and 37 says, And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. <clears throat> False religion is demonic. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20 says, But I say that the things with the, which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. <clears throat> False religion comes from the devil. <clears throat> Satan is disguised as an angel of light. That's what he does. <clears throat> Even in chapter 4 of 1 John, we find that you can test the spirits, whether they're from God, <clears throat> by whether the spirit confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Verse 3 says, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and <clears throat> this is the spirit of Antichrist. So Satan is that Antichrist. Satan is the one who proclaims the lies. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 
So false religion, the false religions of the world, they contain the doctrines of devils, the doctrines of demons. And so if you understand that, then you understand what a spiritual young man is, what a spiritual teenager is, <clears throat> and how a spiritual teenager has overcome the wicked one. Because if you know sound doctrine, then you've overcome the wicked one. <clears throat> and you know, it's, it's wonderful to see spiritual teenagers, people who have come to the point in their Christian life <clears throat> whose doctrine is sound. They're not constantly blown around by, I just heard this the other day. Is that true? Is I just heard this the other day. And maybe I should be going to that church over there. They, they seem to have a whole lot more uh, uh, um, of the Holy Spirit there. Various things like that. <clears throat> when you have reached the stage of being a spiritual teenager, the cults no longer attract you. False doctrine doesn't lure you. You're not easily deceived. <clears throat> In fact, generally speaking, when you reach the stage of being a spiritual teenager, you get angry with a lot of that stuff. <clears throat> you want to fight it. <clears throat> and and I, it's good to see that. <clears throat> when somebody arrives at that point in their spiritual development, they want to do battle with the cults. They want to straighten out the, the JWs, the Jehovah Witnesses. They want to correct the liberals. <clears throat> and I still confess I've got some of that in, in me from the time of being a spiritual teenager. <clears throat> it angers me still. Uh, <clears throat> false doctrine and lies <clears throat> and people standing behind pulpits telling lies. <clears throat> it angers me. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to be led astray by false doctrine. I'm not going to be deceived. Why? Because I am strong in the Word. I know what the Word of God teaches. <clears throat> and in that sense, Satan cannot deceive me. Now, <clears throat> I know it sounds like it, but that's not boasting. That's simply the result of studying the Bible for decades. I no longer have to wonder uh, whether or not Jesus was born of a virgin, whether or not he lived a perfect, sinless life. I don't have to wonder about whether or not my salvation is forever or can I lose it. I'm not deceived by those things any longer because in decades of studying the Word of God, I know what I know. <clears throat> so if Satan comes along and says, Jesus is not God, I don't care how good his argument is, I ain't going to buy it. <clears throat> if Satan comes along and says, you know, God's not a trinity, I don't care what, what argument he makes, I'm not going to buy that. I don't care how clever <clears throat> the speaker may be if <clears throat> it's a lie, if it's a uh, false lie, I don't buy it. Somebody comes along and says that Jesus was a sinner on the cross and, and he went to hell for three days to suffer for his sin. I don't believe that. <clears throat> Somebody comes and says the Bible's not the inspired word of God. It's not inerrant. I don't believe it. I don't care what kind of argument that person puts forth. It's not a matter that I don't believe it because I've just, this is where I stand and <clears throat> this is the, the decision that I've made and this is no, I don't believe it because I know the truth. These are things that I have studied. I'm not going to buy into people's proposition that uh, um, the Word of God is not trustworthy. Uh, in fact, if people tell me that I shouldn't use the King James Bible any longer because it's outdated or it's too hard to understand, I don't buy that either. I want uh, to park here for a few minutes, which I can't because we're out of time, so it'll have to be next week. <clears throat> but this is a real issue, even with good and godly Christians. <clears throat> and what I learned a long time ago, which doesn't seem to get taught very often any longer, is that there is a huge difference between the underlying text, the Greek text of the King James Bible, and all the other English versions. Huge difference. So we're going to have to pick that up next week. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll...